let's uh, just bring you up to speed on how the championship points lie as well at the end of uh, Aragon. Fabio Quartararo, 214 points now ahead of Peko Bagnaia, who's got up to second. 53-point lead for Quartararo currently. Mir in third with 157. Zarco, 137, down to fourth, just in front of Jack Miller. And actually, it's probably worth touching just before we do move on to Moto2, because we will swing back around as ever to MotoGP once we've done it. But uh, Touching on the other Ducati riders, uh, particularly, you know, Miller looked like he was in for a podium, but again, a mistake cost him that. And then uh, on the Pramac Ducati, Zarco, what happened? Well, perhaps a medium rear tyre, Pete. What do you think? But it is, it, <laughs> it's, the only it's, one it's been a downhill it. spiral ever since the, the summer break, really. Well, you know, I tell you the one thing you don't do, you don't look across the paddock and, and every other team and think, I'm the one that's right. <laughs> one medium tire on the entire grid, you know, like, and and every other rider had a soft rear. You know, it just and he's a guy who can make a soft work normally, if I remember rightly. Zarco has has, has got a gentle touch with with tires, and you know, it was even more surprising that he decided that the medium was the way to go. But it was one of those um, shot in the darks, I think. Really, he obviously wasn't going as well as he was hoping he'd go, so he decided that uh, maybe there was something late race that the medium might um, give him, but it didn't. Yeah, I mean, he, he said himself he's still searching for exactly as you say the feeling he had with the bike at the start of the year. It sort of seems to have left him somehow, and he's not able to get it back. And yeah, it was it was the front he went for the medium, as you say. Which, the, I mean, he's a very smooth rider, so maybe he could have made it work, but. Yeah, I mean, the results, it's its not there at the moment. Martin, on the other side, he actually struggled a bit as well physically. You know, he's had these injuries earlier in the year and Aragon is a its a, its a tough track. You know, it's a very challenging track, as Keith was saying. And he actually he actually found that physically he was, he was sort of hurting a bit. But you've got to expect that he'll be back up there and uh, looking to impress him from the Ducati bosses. Um, you know, his heroics, of course, have kind of overshadowed Bastianini's season as Keith was rightly praising him. You know, if 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 Martin hadn't been winning races as a, as a rookie and on pole position, Bastianini would be getting a lot more attention and credit. But he certainly deserves it. They, you know, Bastianini came to the pole this weekend, and you know, from what I from what I've been told, he, he's seen as being very important to the future of Ducati. That's what I was told earlier in this year when it, when it wasn't clear where he would be next year. That you know he will be on a Ducati. Don't worry. He's seen as as someone that they they've already seen enough to know he's going to be well following the line of maybe Pecco as the next Italian star. So, yeah, he looks like he's got a great future ahead. Mm, well, a, a great result as ever for Bastianini in P6 at the end. Uh, it was action, certainly, up and down MotoGP, up and down the classes as well. Let's turn our attention to Moto2. It was Ralph Fernandez who fought through injury to collect his fifth win of the season in Moto2, despite you know the obvious pain he's been carrying throughout the weekend. He managed to uh, overcome pole man Sam Lowe's and championship leader Remy Gardner to take the win. Not so good a day for Sam Lowe's, who was managing the pace early on it seemed but the pressure from Fernandez proved a little bit too much and that put pay to his chances Keith what did you make of the Moto2 action sadly Sam did what Sam does you know Alex his brother was on site as well and and trying to keep him calm and it looked like he not settled for second place he was beginning to reapply the pressure to Raul Fernandez out front Fernandez had got immense early pace and you know, we wondered whether he'd run out of fitness, you know, right hand injury, you know, an operation last week, uh, fifth, is it fourth metatarsal or something? Is that the one in your hand? I can't remember. Is it a metacarpal, metatarsal, one of them bones anyway, but it's one in his right hand. Right hand, you do quite a bit with your right hand on a motorbike. It's quite a handy thing. And uh, to have that kind of pain going through him, and we're in a no, no needles policy nowadays as well. So it's not... You can't have injections and all the rest of it now. It's it's a couple of paracetamol or whatever it might be that the doctor says. Um, so you're in a situation where you know pain relief is 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 different to how it used to be as well, uh, or what was allowed before. So he did brilliantly, brilliantly well. But Sam's demise was all Sam's demise. It had nothing to do with anybody else. It was he had a big enough gap in front of him, but was pushing. He was a tenth or two up on the last few laps before he he went down. Easy place to make that kind of mistake that Sam made but just he makes it just that little bit too often and that it's critical really um you know you feel for him you know he keeps on he looks just brilliantly he was brilliant in qualifying pole position got a great start 
which is something that he doesn't always do. Looked like he was, you know, going to be able to put it out there at his pace for a few laps just for, while it all settled down behind him. Rael Fernandez just started to really power into it. Um, and again, looked consistent on lap times. Fernandez had got the thing nailed down really, really hard. But Sam, I don't know what to say. I, I don't know where he'll be at this moment in time in his head. You know, it, I always think that when when we get an interview with Sam and we see him just before a race, he speaks too fast for someone who's calm. And it kind of worries me that he's he's just so hyper. He's so, the adrenaline's pumping like mad. But he'd gone through all that that difficult part of the race for me and then it slides out from under him just a disaster and it's going to affect his head there's no doubt about it well he uh, slid out from a, a chance of a podium it was Ralph Fernandez who took the win ahead of Remy Gardner and Augusto Fernandez at the final uh, podium placer P and what was quite a, a fierce battle really between him and uh, and Jorge Navarro but uh, he found his way past him on the penultimate lap in the end uh, perhaps you know a lot of results helped by the 11 retirements as well but uh, a great battle for third it was yes and, and this came after Augusto Fernandez was announced this weekend as moving to the IO team next year so he's going to be going across and and We'll be looking to join that that ladder heading, you know, KTM wise to, to MotoGP. So a good time to sort of impress his future team, I guess, as well. Um, and and yet yeah, by being you know behind um, uh, the AO guys on Sunday. And I thought Gardner did a very mature ride in second. Speaking of, of that, you know, it's not a great track for him. It, it might have been easy to maybe think, you know, my teammate's injured. What you know, I should be beating him, uh, and maybe just you know push a bit too hard. But he didn't, you know, he, he took the safe option. He took the, the 20 points and he, he keeps this healthy. I think it's 39 point lead, isn't it? Um, yeah. we, we know now, as you're saying about the calendar, we, we only have five rounds left now. Argentina's gone, so it, it won't be replaced. So it's five rounds left, 39 point leads. And he can, you know, it, it's big enough for him to manage. And I think that was that was a really mature ride by, by Remy as well. Mm. Talking of mature, I thought John McPhee, I mean, first motor two race, John McPhee looked really good on that bike through free practice and qualifying, bearing in mind that yeah, that's nowhere near enough time to get used to a motorbike of any kind. If you rode a road bike, it wouldn't wouldn't be enough time to get used to it. I mean, all the everything's in a different place. Everything performs in a different way. It was a remarkable ride from John McPhee. Okay, he got a 20th. There was only one bloke behind him in the end. And like you've already quite rightly alluded to, there were 11 people that already went out of this race. So McPhee's 20th seems on paper perhaps slightly better than it might have done. But it was a good ride from him and he looked good on the bike and he did what he had to do. If he'd thrown it through the fence, you know, trying too hard, then McPhee's ride wouldn't look good to other, you know, to other teams that are looking in. And maybe maybe they will just look and think, do you know what? He rode that bike okay through free practice. He rode that bike okay through qualifying. He looked good in the race. You know, he finished the race. If you look at, what was he, 40, 47 seconds down in a 21-lap race at the end of it. So off of Rail Fernandez's blistering times, he was a couple of seconds a lap off of that, you know, in traffic, getting used to a motorbike. I think McPhee did a really, really good job, personally. I, I think that, um, that uh, hopefully the paddock always knows. You can't lie in the paddock. You can lie to everyone on Twitter and, and Facebook and all the other places. You can you can pull the wool over. You can have a PR man that's putting all the right spiel out there and all the rest of it and fool a few of the public, perhaps, by some swift PR. But you can't fool those beggars in the paddock. They know everything. They see everything. They, you know, they know exactly what's going on. And they will have seen a good ride from John McPhee. You know, teams that are considering you know, where the hiring and firing is going on in the next little while. They'll have seen McPhee do a very mature job this weekend. And he's still only, what, 27? You know, so he's he's not over and done with yet. He'd make a good Moto2 rider. He's light as well, which, you know, if you, if you can ride a Moto2 bike and you're a few pounds lighter than the average, you've immediately got an advantage there too. He's a thinker. He's a, he's a Grand Prix winner. You know, McPhee's not over and done yet. I, I'd be really, I, I'm happy with what he's done, and I would love to see him ride a bit more during the course of the year. I don't think we're going to get that chance, unfortunately, but um, I think he rode really, really Could well. Could have happened just in the nick yeah. of time. Pete, yeah, have you heard much about McPhee or from McPhee? I was just going to say, yeah, it's a similar thing. I think from what John was saying, that, that 
he had some a few moments on the full fuel tank, and and he just sort of thought, right, let's just calm this down, you know. And, and then he, he so he dropped back, but then he sort of regrouped and came through. Um, as Keith says, you know, it would have been easy to sort of let it all get to you, and you know, the guys are going by me, but he didn't, you know, regrouped. Stuck, he overtook a few riders, you know, and he was having a good battle with, I think it was Zami Cardloose at the end, you know, he's an established Moto 2 rider and just beat him to the line. So he, he was in a fight. He, he did, as Keith said, he, he's a bit like Jacob Silverstone. He's, he's now put himself a lot better off as far as next year after this weekend than he was before it. And I think just on, just on Jake, forgot to mention, but it sounds like what happened with him, he, he ran off track, rejoined. And his front tire was too cold. You know, the temperature had dropped, and so he he then fell. I think about five corners later on the second lap, just got caught out by the having you know run off track. The temperature had gone hard, front tire, and that was down he went. So it just just one of those things, and uh, yeah, unfortunate because it, as Keith says, you know, it would have been great to build on his performance. He did he did chip away, he got a bit closer to the to the you know the. The top, if you like, he reduced the gap, and with a big, long straight at Aragon, you could chop a few tenths off just for the, the top speed of that Yamaha. But yeah, unfortunately, he didn't put the race distance together, but John McPhee did. And you know, it's not easy also knowing that the team's going to be disbanded. You know, a lot of people are working there, and the riders are there, not knowing about their future. You know, Jake, Jake and John are the obvious guys, but everyone in that team must surely be thinking, what's going to happen? There's some talk that maybe the, you know the team might be taken over by someone else, or, or might continue you know, under another name, you know, someone might come in, but, but who knows, you know, at the moment it's all up in the air. And so you're trying to, you're trying to you know, produce and, you know, your best performances and learn this new bike with all of this other stuff going on. So a difficult situation. And I absolutely agree with Keith. I think McPhee's done a really solid job. Somebody knows what's going on and they know absolutely what's going on. You can be absolutely sure of that. There'll be teams that know what's happening Who's filling that void? You know, Mike Trimby at Erta, International Race Teams Association, will have names, teams. There'll be a long line going to his office at Erta at each of the tracks. So um, they'll know what's going on and what the replacements are going to be. And we'll find out in the next few weeks, I'm sure, and um, bring it here on Crash, that's for certain. Um, but it's what McPhee has done is he's added an extra string to his bow. He was a Motor 3 rider, a race winner, but would you speculate on him going into Moto2 and being successful? Probably not. You know, it's a situation where you think to yourself, he's, he's, you know, sometimes he has great rides, sometimes he has so-so rides. You know, would we risk, you know, bringing him, in, him into a Moto2 uh, team? I think after what we saw this weekend as just a, a starting point, I think, yes, you would. You'd certainly test him. You'd certainly look at where you can go from here. He's got a good brain, John McPhee. You know, the... Moto2 is closer to MotoGP than it is to Moto3. So it's a big leap that he's done to go from Moto3 to Moto2 in a one-off ride at a racetrack. No testing, no ride it down the road, nothing. Just jump straight on it. Most people have had two or three days of intensive testing, um, plus early early doors you know, runs here, there, and everywhere. They know exactly what's going on with the bike. They've got everything in position. He would have got on that bike on free practice one and thought, the handlebars, you know, they need to cut the mill this way. The, you know, I don't quite like, like where my levers are. Where's them buttons again? What are they, you know? He'll have been working through all of that in the first couple of free practices. And, of course, free practice is actually qualifying for qualifying, as we know nowadays. You know, every single session, every single lap you do on a motorbike at a Grand Prix means something, <laughs> quite a lot, in fact. Free practice is a qualifying session to be in the best qualifying session. So I think McPhee did really, really well. Am I blowing it up a bit too much? I, I, we'll get, I we'll get some comments, that's for sure. But uh, smiles all around, I think, though, for, for John McPhee after the, an admirable performance there in 20th, uh, making his debut in MotoGP. But here's how the points look, though, at the top of the time. Uh, tap, tap, tap top of the table uh Remy Gardner with that second place finish now has 251 points it is a 39 point lead over Ralph Fernandez with 212 Marco Bezecchi still in third 179 Sam Lowe's fourth 127 and Augusto Fernandez now with 108 behind Lowe's in the standings let's uh, focus now if I may be so bold on Moto3 it was Dennis Fodger who uh, fought his way through to the front to take the win ahead of Dennis Onku and uh, Ayumi Sazaki, a feisty battle for victory uh, until Fodger shut the door firmly and uh, headed to the chequered flag for the win, really, Keith, wasn't it? So uh, Moto3 once again providing some Moto3 action. <laughs> Typical Moto3 action. Yeah, as it, 
Never, ever a dull moment in Moto3, that is for certain. What was remarkable for me was that the KTMs looked like they had all the speed in Austria, fast racetrack and the like, and yet here the Honda looked head and shoulders above the KTM in a straight line in the way of Foggia. Glad you said that he fought his way through because he did. I mean, he was, what, 12th you know, at the early lap and 10th place and then slowly but surely working his way through. You know, his Artigas, his bloody teammate, got taken out by Pedro Acosta, the, the championship leader in a ridiculous... Pedro Acosta, could he have hit anything else out there? I mean, he took the paint off everything that I could see. I mean, Acosta, I know he's young, but blimey, he was in a, 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 the weirdest of moods. I mean, all the accuracy and all the... You know, he's tenacious and he's hard. We've seen that. But he was just that, that tiny degree off in every move he made. Every move he made, instead of it being a pass, and we were all going, wow, did you see how he did that? It was, oh, why did he do that? It was just, honestly, he rubbed so many people up the wrong way. And in the end, he really did. Artigas, you know, teammate to Foggia, was nailed to the to the floor, took him out massively. And he's hurt. I mean, we're going. We've only got a weekend, a week off, really. We're, we're straight out next weekend. So Artigas, you know, with those last what five races to go, is is going to be doing them injured effectively because they're coming thick and fast. Um, but then, poor old Garcia, you have got a feel for him. I mean, he he obviously didn't know where Acosta was. You would think. I'm um, fairly, you know, maybe had Acosta out. But if if you look at that pit boards down that pit lane. When you're rushing past there, even on a Moto3 bike, you're doing 120 mile an hour. You're coming up over a crest. So every, you can't see anything coming out the last corner. Can't see anything come up over a crest. Then all of a sudden, you're concentrating on, on your braking point coming up for turn one. You're on the right-hand side of the track, away from the pit wall. You're not near the pit wall. It's quite a wide bit of track. And there's a 100 well, – there's not a 100, obviously, because there's not 100 bikes out there now by the time we got to this <laughs> point. But there's, you know, 20-odd bikes – uh, 20 odd boards that are all hanging over the wall it's a it's an absolute cluster of of written word all the way down the side there's no ship to shore to to have warned him what was going on because that's obviously not allowed so the fact was that if he missed his board and didn't see that acosta was out um he was still trying to maximize his points and then again it was one of those crashes that just washed out the front end from under him Sam Lowe's esque and so many others this weekend because there are you know corners here that just wipe the front out and down he went. Acosta very much uh, getting sort of let off the hook there. Do you think this was a little bit of a sign of you know sixteen years old? We think we've been saying how mature he is in his racing up to this point, but is was this a little a little drop of uh, that maturity? Not so sure of maturity, but I think a rush of blood to the head. I mean, you know, maybe it's getting to him a little bit. We're getting towards the end of the, the series. You know, he's got five races left. He's, he's, you know, he's going to be world champion if he hangs it together fairly well. Not if he does what he's done this weekend. Not if he's going to get the penalties he gets. Um, you know, if, if there are any retrospectives. I haven't seen the sheets to see if there are any retrospective penalties. Probably he got away with it. I don't know. Otherwise, I think we will have seen something. But um, it's certainly a situation where he's got to calm himself. And that's where his management will do that. And they're good. You know, that they will speak to him and sort him out on that, calm him down before he goes out. He just needs a little bit of a talking to. I think it was, I think it was a bit of a blip this weekend for Acosta. Um, he wasn't where he wanted to be in the race and was trying to force every single uh, corner to work for him and the bike, and it just didn't. He was, he was right on the edge all the way through. We've seen it before with him, and he's got away with it. Um, a bit Marquez esque, if you like, in the past. I've always thought of Acosta the way he gets away with some of the maneuvers he makes. You think, wow, that's tight, but he gets it. Um, this weekend, he didn't. No, he didn't. And someone who did get it, though, up in third, Ayumi Sasaki, who uh, managed to get his first podium of the season, P, able to really kind of pick up the pieces from those around him. Yeah, a, a great race for, for Tectoire, wasn't it? Both two riders on the podium. So it was, uh, yeah, I mean, the Tectoire guys, haven't they? Both riders have been sort of so near so far and there's been a lot of near misses for them and bad luck and things like that. And, and Onchu, I mean, he's been so close to winning so many times now, hasn't he? I mean, he, he said he could almost smell the victory <laughs> today. But, but you know, he bought them. It's more podiums. They're, they're building confidence. They're getting better each weekend. And, yeah, as far as Acosta, I mean, yeah, it was it was, it was a kind of a rookie race, wasn't it, that, that we haven't seen from him. 
Um, and I think, yeah, he he perhaps he, he got out of jail free, didn't he, as far as the championship with, with Garcia's mistake. But certainly I think he'll be looking to restore order a little bit at Mizano. Um, it was a home race for him. Was, was that a factor? I don't know. You know, did that just add a little bit more pressure or something? I would say probably, Pete. I think you've hit it on the head there. It's the kind of racetrack that he's gone round a thousand times and uh, and it's one of them ones he would have expected to perform at. Uh, which turned in, into a, a I, I think you're right. I think that is the the nerve, the nerve end that he was playing with throughout the entire weekend. Well, it... and a thought, and a thought, and a thought for Fanati, bless him, being Rodrigo'd. I mean, what is it with Gabri Rodrigo? He has no there's a, there's a disconnect between his brain and his right hand, because I've never seen a Moto three guy high side as often as he does. He just he seems he seems to have. I think he's got a switch, not a throttle. It's either off or on. <laughs> Once again, he lost the rear end, fired himself. I mean, Fanati, you know, finally he got away with it, but he took Fanati out into the dirt and, and ruined his race as well. But Gabriel Rodrigo had the kind of pace that could be right up there podium-wise if if he got it worked out. But for some strange reason, once again, Rodrigo's in the thick of it. And the man in frame to jump Moto2 and go straight into Moto GP, Darren Binder. Only seventh. Yeah, I was surprised at that. I didn't. Re- I haven't really heard what the reasoning in his head was for that because he had that kind of pace that I thought was going to put him on the podium at least. You know, and in hard braking, there's quite a few places you can make a pass here if you've got his kind of style. There's there's a few places you can ram it up the inside, and if all else fails, you've got that final you know double apex. I think they call it turn 16 and 17, but I always only ever think of it as one turn. That final, I love the corner. It's a beautiful corner. And late on in a race when your tyres have gone off and everything, you've got so many lines that you can get through there. I mean, you know, out wide, up tight, whatever you like, whichever way your bike actually suits it. So there's a real opportunity to drag race somebody to the line as well. But I thought it would have been, I thought Binder would have performed better. But I haven't heard, Pete, anything from the track of you. I, I think I think he had an issue with, with top speed or with the, the straight line speed of his bike. It, all, it was certainly less than they were expecting and they, they didn't seem to know why and they're, they're certainly going to look into it. But yeah, it means no. still he's had two podiums in Qatar, wasn't it? And I think nothing since. And, you know, we, we talk about, as you say, Harry, going from Moto3 to MotoGP. And of course, you think of Jack Miller having done that. But I mean, Jack fought for the World Championship. Jack was basically, him and Alex Marquez, they were pretty much even. He, Jack could easily have won that year. I mean, it's one thing going up as one of the you know the big stars at the very forefront of the class. It's, it's another one going up when you've only got two podiums, isn't it? And I think, yeah, I think they'll, um, you know, he needs to finish the year strongly. I mean, Mizano coming up, we're supposed to hear a lot more about this this new team for next year. So maybe when everything's out in the open, it will clear the heads of, of you know, the riders, everyone involved, and, and perhaps there'll be a better end of the year. Well, after Aragon, it is status quo at the top of the uh, standings in Moto3. Pedro Costa, 201 points, still has that 46-point lead over Sergio Garcia. Dennis Foggia in third with 143. Fanati, 134, back in fourth. And Masia with 111, just behind him. And uh, before we come on to uh, chat about the next Grand Prix in Misano. I think it's worth touching on uh, coming into the weekend as well. We did have confirmation of the rest of the 2021 calendar. So, Pete, we will be getting, well, by the end of this year, we will have had 18 rounds and we're going to finish at Valencia, aren't we? 